Well, I do indeed invite you to turn with me uh, in the Gospel according to Luke today. We did uh, turn to the Gospel of Luke on uh, Christmas Eve. but We've turned there again uh, this morning to Luke chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. We're going to cover several of the verses that were read on Christmas Eve. But we're going to continue on to another critically important part of this passage. The Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, if you are using one of the Maroon Bibles, this can be found on page 880, page 880. I begin reading, brothers and sisters, in Luke 2, verse 1. I'll be reading through verse 24 of that chapter. But I draw your special attention to verse 21. Verse 21 will constitute our text for today. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Let us hear then the word of the Lord. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, He was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together today. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, just the other day I did a Google search on what were the 10 most popular boys' names back in the year 1920. And what, are the, what were the most popular 10 boys' names 100 years ago this year? They were the following. John, William, James, Robert, Joseph, George, Charles, Richard, Edward, and Donald. And then I did another search, and I went 50 years forward. And I was wondering what were the 10 most popular boys' names in the year 1970. And it turned out that in 1970, these were the 10 most popular boys' names. Michael, John, 
Christopher, David, James, Jason, Robert, William, Brian, and Matthew. And then I went forward another 50 years to the year 2020. And I was wondering what the most popular 10 boys' names were for this year. Turns out that they were as follows. William, Oliver, Liam, Lucas, Noah, Mason, Benjamin, Ethan, James, and Elijah. And then I did a little bit of a comparison, and I said, well, this is kind of interesting. If you go back 100 years, and then uh, to 1920, you've, and then f go forward 50 years to 1970, there were nearly 50% of the names for that were the same in 1920 and 1970 among the top 10. And then I found it interesting that when you went another 50 years forward to this year, 2020, there were only two names that were the most popular in the top 10 this year that were also the most popular in 1970 and 1920. And those two names that were kind of, you know, longevity popular are the names William and James, William and James. Now, friends, I found it also very interesting that when I looked at those three different uh, top 10 lists, 1920, 1970, and 2020, and all of those names, not once did I find the name Jesus. Not once did I find the name Jesus. And of course, that shouldn't surprise us in the least. Because as we turn to our study of the sacred scriptures today, we find that there was, is, and forever will be only one name that the angel Gabriel told Mary to name that child even before he was conceived. We find great joy and incredible comfort by God's grace by professing faith in that name and rejoicing in the fact that he was called Jesus. He was called Jesus. Now, in a very personal and practical way, what does that have to do with you and me? Practically speaking, personally speaking, what difference does it make for you and me that he was named Jesus? Well, as we look at the words of our text for today as recorded in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, and look at some other passages of Scripture, we find that it's important, first of all, to consider the fact that he was named Jesus when he was circumcised. It's incredibly important to notice the fact that he was named Jesus when he was circumcised. For example, look at verse 21 with me, if you would, please. It says here in the words of our text, On the eighth day, notice, when it was time to circumcise the child. Or as the King James says, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child. Or as the ESV states, And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised. Now, friends, that begs the question, why is it so significant to note that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day? Why is that a significant period of time? Well, first of all, being circumcised on the eighth day is significant because medical science has discovered, and I use the word discovered advisedly because God already knew this. Medical science has discovered that the circumcision of a male child helps ward off infection. Secondly, medical science has discovered, because God already knew this, and I'm quoting now, that vitamin K, which is essential for blood clotting, apparently peaks on the eighth day. End of quote. Think about that. Now, I was doing a little research yesterday, and interestingly enough, vitamin K, I, we could ask the nurses here today, vitamin K apparently has some positive effects even concerning the coronavirus. I was reading some articles on that yesterday, as well as vitamin D and some other vitamins as well. But especially concerning that blood clotting, the eighth day is the peak for when the vitamin K is, is the most effective, and that is the day in which God commanded that Jesus should be circumcised. But friends, the lack of infection or the warding off of infection and the uh, maximizing of blood clotting are not even the main reasons or the most important reasons why our text teaches us that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Well, what other reason could there be? Well, 
If you would care to turn with me, let's go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus, the 12th chapter. If you want to just listen, that's okay. But otherwise, turn back with me, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 12. In the uh, Maroon Bible, it's found on page 94, page 94, Leviticus, chapter 12. Look with me, if you would please, at the first three verses of Leviticus, chapter 12. Here we read, the Lord said to Moses, and notice the four capital letters in Lord. It's the name Yahweh, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God of Israel. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. Note verse 3. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Notice the Bible does not say on the eighth day he may be circumcised or he might be circumcised or he can be circumcised. The Bible says very literally on the eighth day the boy is to be circumcised. The King James Version, the New American Standard Version say on the eighth day he shall be circumcised. He shall be circumcised. In other words, Jesus being circumcised on the eighth day was in obedience to a divine decree that was given by Almighty God and was part of the ceremonial law for His people. Now, friends, not only so, let's go back to uh, Luke chapter 2 in the context of our text and look with me, please, in Luke chapter 2, drop down to verses 22 through 24. Luke 2, 22 through 24. Here we read. When the time came for the purification rites required notice by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. And you may be able to see in your Bible there, there are several Old Testament footnotes that are being quoted in verses 22 through 24. Look at verse 27 of Luke 2 with me, verse 27. It says, Moved by the Spirit, he, that is Simeon, went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, notice what the custom of the law required. Similarly, flip over a page perhaps to verse 39 of Luke chapter 2, verse 39. Here we read, When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And brothers and sisters, do you remember what Jesus said to his own disciples concerning the fulfillment of the law of God? He says it in the Gospel according to Matthew, if you'll turn back with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and if you're taking notes, it's verses 17 and 18, Matthew 5, 17 and 18, part of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says to His disciples, Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For, I truly, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Thus, finally on this score, if you would care to turn to Galatians 4 with me, page 1003 in our uh, Maroon Bibles, page 1003, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians 4. Notice what we read in verses 4 through 7 of Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. The Apostle Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, But when the time set has fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, notice, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but literally a son, God's child, and since you are His child, God has made you also an heir. Brothers and sisters, the essential point is this. By undergoing circumcision on the eighth day, as personally painful as that was for the baby Jesus, the point is, is that he was succeeding where our first parent, Adam, had failed. Adam was commanded to obey God, to obey the law of God, to not eat from the tree that was in the middle of the garden. And he disobeyed. 
And he plunged the entire human race thereby into sin and death and destruction and spiritual corruption. Their theologians refer to what happened after Adam's fall as total depravity. The original sin which corrupted all of our nature. Doesn't mean every person's as bad as they could possibly be. But it means all of our thinking, our feeling, our affections, our will are infected with and tainted by and corrupted by sin. And boys and girls, you know, the theological terms of it is that Adam was our federal head, our covenant representative. But a way that's perhaps easier for you to understand is that in Adam's fall, we sinned all. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. When Adam sinned, we sinned. And we inherited that corrupting sinful nature. But where Adam failed, you see, Christ succeeded. In fact, if you would care to turn with me, I just came across this text anew the other day. Turn to a Romans chapter 5. If you want to just listen, that's okay. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans 5, verse 19, page 970 in our Maroon Bible, page 970, Romans 5, verse 19. Get this, critically important uh, part in relation, text in relation to our text for today. Romans 5, verse 19. Paul writes, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. And so you see, Jesus didn't only come into the world sinless by being conceived of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He lived a perfectly sinless life, perfectly obeying the law of God for us. Because you and I fail and have failed and will fail miserably. Think of it. How many times have you and I been guilty of idolatry? Worshipping or putting our hope and trust in something or someone other than the Lord our God, our triune God. Jesus was never guilty of idolatry. How many times have you and I blasphemed or taken in vain or misused the name of the Lord our God? Jesus never did. How many times have, have you and I violated or desecrated the Sabbath day? The Bible says remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. How many times have you and I not done that? Jesus always remembered the Sabbath day. Boys and girls, young people, how many times have you or have I dishonored or disobeyed our parents? Honor your father and your mother, the fifth commandment. Probably many times. And yet Jesus never did. He never disobeyed, dishonored his mother and his father. How many times have you and I committed emotional murder? You shall not kill. And yet we've hated people and been embittered toward them in our hearts. Jesus never was. How many times have you and I committed, if not physical, emotional adultery? Lusting after someone. Jesus never did. How many times have you and I perhaps taken something that did not belong to us. You shall not steal. Jesus never did. How many times may you or I have coveted someone or something that did not belong to us? Jesus never did. <laughs> Where we have failed repeatedly and miserably, my dear brothers and sisters, the point is that he perfectly obeyed the law of God for us. So that by His grace alone, through faith alone, His perfect righteousness is imputed to us. It's credited to us. God sees us justified, just as if I never sinned. Because on Calvary's cross, all of our sins, this whole record of our sins through the entire course of our life was laid on Him. It was laid on Him. And He experienced the eternal wrath of God for us when He cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I wouldn't have to cry that for all eternity. And he set us free, his righteousness imputed to us. God made him who had no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And friends, that equipped our Lord Jesus Christ to be our perfect and sinless Savior. In fact, if you would care to take your hymnal again, don't, don't close your Bible, but turn in the back of the hymnal with me, please, once again, to page 874, page 874, and there's this great, uh, a couple Lord's Days 
on, on what we're talking about right now from the scriptures. It's page 874, Lord's Day 5. We're going to go into Lord's Day 6. I'm just going to read the questions just in, in like, like we're having a dialogue and just read the answers with me. Beginning on page 874, Lord's Day 5, question 12. It starts the part of the catechism dealing with our salvation, dealing with our deliverance. So on page 874, Lord's Day 5, we're just going to do this like in dialogue fashion. Read answers with me. According to God's righteous judgment, we deserve punishment both now and in eternity. How then can we escape this punishment and return to God's favor? God requires that his justice be satisfied. Therefore, the claims of this justice must be paid in full, either by ourselves or by another. Can we make this payment ourselves? Certainly not. Actually, we increase our debt every day. Can another creature, any at all, pay this debt for us? No. To begin with, God will not punish any other creature for what a human is guilty of. Furthermore, no mere creature can bear the weight of God's eternal wrath against sin and deliver others from it. What kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for then? One who is true and righteous man, yet more powerful than all creatures. That is, one who is also true God. Why must the mediator be a true and righteous man? Because God's justice requires that human nature, which has sinned, must pay for its sin. But a sinner could never pay for others. Why must he also be true God? So that by the power of his divinity, he might bear in his humanity the weight of God's wrath and earn for us and restore to us righteousness and life. Then who is this mediator, true God, and at the same time, a true and righteous man? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who was given to us for our complete deliverance and righteousness. Thus far, all glory be to God. Bring that information, brothers and sisters, in your hearts and your minds, back to the words of our text in Luke chapter 2, verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus. He was named Jesus. All glory be to God. Ah, but notice, not only is it extremely significant and personally practical for you and me that he was called Jesus, he was named Jesus, and that he was circumcised on the eighth day, it's also incredibly important for us to realize that he was named Jesus even before he was conceived. Even before he was conceived. For notice, Luke 2, 21, once again, on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus. Now notice, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Now, boys and girls, do you know what the account was, what was going on when the angel gave the word to name him Jesus even before he was conceived? Who was he talking to? Who was, who was the angel talking to? The angel, the angel was talking, thank you, Nick. The angel was talking to Mary. The angel was talking to Mary. Just go back a page or two to Luke chapter 1 and drop down with me, please, to verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel, notice, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And we talked about why that was important on Christmas Eve. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was great. She was just a young girl, boys and girls, probably in her early to mid-teens. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Friends, but not only so. Not only did the angel Gabriel tell Mary to name him Jesus before he was even conceived, but if you want to flip back to the gospel according to Matthew with me, just keep going back to the left to Matthew chapter 1, page 827. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Notice what also had occurred about that time. 
In Matthew 1.18 we read, This is how the birth of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, came about. Matthew 1.18, His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, notice, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. By the way, did that ever struck you as odd? Why he had to consider divorce, being that they were only engaged? Reason is because their betrothal was different than our engagement. You hear of people breaking engagements today, and if, and if, if the marriage shouldn't take place, it's better to break it before the marriage than after the marriage. But here you have a betrothal. It was, it was more like a, like a, almost like a marriage. That's why you'd have to divorce to break a betrothal. And that, that's why it's a, it was a lot more of a serious relationship. But at verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. We don't know if it was the angel Gabriel or not, but some heavenly messenger, perhaps Gabriel, like who appeared to Mary. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him, notice, the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Boys and girls, remember we read just a few moments ago, earlier in the service, why is he called Jesus? Meaning Savior. The name Jesus means Savior. And that is why, if you would turn over to Acts chapter 4 with me, if you want to just listen, that's okay. But otherwise, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, page 938. These were some of the footnotes that were in that Lord's Day about why He's called Jesus and the fact that the name Jesus means Savior. In Acts 4, 11 and 12, the Apostle Peter is preaching under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says in Acts 4, 11 and 12, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Similarly, if you're taking notes, in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, the Apostle Paul proclaims, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. And finally on this score, in John 14, verse 6, our Lord Jesus Himself declares, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. That's not a very popular teaching today. There are a lot of people who get very angry at Christians for the exclusivity of the claims of Christ, but it is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All glory be to God. And we bring that biblical information to bear back on the words of our text in Luke 2, 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him, notice, before he was even conceived before he was even conceived wow well you know friends i don't know about you but in this christmas season i really enjoy rereading uh the narratives in the in the gospels about the birth of christ and the angels and the shepherds and all that sort of thing and and i'm always fascinated by some of the characters and some of the the drama that takes place and when you reread the gospel accounts you often find something that you had missed over the years and you and you see something new well for example here in Luke 2, in the broader context of our text, we read these two people named Simeon and Anna. Simeon and Anna. It's very interesting how they are incorporated here uh, in the words of the text. For example, uh, look at verses uh, 25 and following with me in Luke 2 concerning Simeon. Luke 2, 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms, picture this, this older man, and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. 
And then, friends, similarly concerning Anna, you might have to turn over a page, but drop down to verses 36 through 38. Verses 36 through 38. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. Think of that. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Friends, needless to say, both Simeon and Anna were exceedingly excited about the birth of Mary's child and the fact that he was named Jesus. But that begs the question, what about you? What about me? Are we truly excited about the fact that at Christmas the baby was born and he was named Jesus? Can we say, for example, with Simeon in verse 30, For my eyes have seen your salvation. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Are we as excited as Anna in verse 38 when she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem? Is that you? And is it me? Oh, my dear, dear friends in the Lord, may God grant to each and every one of us the grace through faith to have our sins forgiven, to have our guilt removed, to be made forever right with the God who created us and before whom we will one day stand as the judge of all the earth. And we have such faith in Him that we, we, we rest and rejoice, not only in time, but will rejoice for all eternity in the incredible consolation to be found in the fact that He was named Jesus. He was named Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Consequently, O Lord our God, is it any wonder then that the sacred songwriter has penned the words, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. O oh, faithful Father, by your sovereign grace, may not a single one of us leave this place without having been saved through faith in the name of Jesus. For his sake we pray. Amen. Amen.